experience in nursing at Kamuzu College of Nursing, where we both did our undergraduate. She did her midwifery training there as well. And then she went back for her master's in midwifery at the same college uh, in Malawi. And one thing about Lucy that I'm very proud of is that she's very passionate about uh, maternal and child health. So she has done really great work um, to see how we can improve maternal and child health in Malawi. And now it's exciting to have her in Gaia where she offers, like she runs programs that promote equitable access to care, including care that surrounds HIV and AIDS. I don't want to take that from her, but I would like her to share to us like what she's currently doing and, and so that we get to know her better. Lucy. Oh, thank you so much, Melanie and Kaboni. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you. And thank you so much for all of you who have joined us on this live stream. Yes, I'm a Malawian nurse who was uh, close to 15 years of working as a nurse practitioner. Uh, when I finished my, uh, my BSc, I worked uh, with the Minister of Health as a nurse practitioner in pediatric ward. That's where I grew my, my interest to now study and specialize in maternal and newborn health. So I've worked with the Malawi government uh, and Cheo district, and later I joined the Cholo district hospital as a senior nursing officer. Then in 2017, I joined this amazing uh, organization, the Gaia Global Health. I've been working with Gaia for more than four years now. Uh, when I joined Gaia, I was working as a program coordinator, overseeing the implementation of a mobile health clinic services, and also the targeted um, community program. So for mobile health clinic, as uh, Kabona said, we, we provide um, outreach clinic services, basic primary health care services, in the Luro masses in Mulanje, Palombe, and we now have included two additional uh, mobile health uh, clinics in Mangochi. So we're bringing services closer to the community, having seen the gap in access to care in Malawi. You know, most of the community members live far away from more than five kilometers. They walk more than five kilometers to go to a health facility. So Gaia provides those services closer to those community members. And uh, it's interesting that when I joined Gaia, uh, we only had these two major uh, programs, including the nursing scholarship, of course, which Gaia is one of the alumni. But then over time, uh, the amazing team at Gaia, we've developed and uh, we had additional activities uh, looking at the additional needs that the community needed. You know, when we provide HIV testing services at a mobile clinic, we noted that main were not actively participating, coming for HIV testing services. So we had to develop a specific project activities to target main, and then we partnered with one community, the John Hopkins, uh, to offer targeted HIV testing services and linking this main uh, to care, health facilities for ART and other services like uh, voluntary male medical circumcision. And also over time, we have a uh, specific activity that we offer support to orphan and vulnerable children, that's um, education support. And we noted that most of the girls being supported uh, were not doing well, apart from uh, receiving the bursary support, school materials, but we had issues where we had some dropping out due to teenage pregnancies. And we partnered with uh, Bantuan, um, Senti Valley, excuse me, sorry, Senti Valley, to offer specific activities targeting girls. So we had special sessions targeting girls uh, that were on Bansali and other girls. So we reached out to 360 girls in Munanji districts. And it was very encouraging to see that most of the girls graduated, uh, completed their uh, secondary school and remained in school throughout the two years. And that has continued because we partnered with the Minister of Education to make sure that the teacher, the female teachers continue with them with the project even if uh, we complete the, the first two years of our implementation. So it's great to see that Gaia is growing and currently I'm overseeing an implementation of a specific uh, projects that targets orphan and vulnerable children. We call it Anabatsogolo. Anabatsogolo focuses on preventing new HIV infection in children uh, under 18 years of age. So we basically uh, follow up children living with HIV and their siblings to make sure that for those that do not know the HIV status, we test them and we offer uh, ART services to them. 
So it's been encouraging uh, that I joined the GAIA and throughout the years working with GAIA, we continue to uh, provide specific targeted interventions to make sure that people living with HIV and the rural masses are able to access care in Malawi. Thank you, Lucy. I think you did you did an incredible job talking about overview of all of our programs from the mobile clinics to the work we do for orphans and vulnerable children um, to our scholarship program for Gaia nurses. Um, you know, I, I think about the last time I saw you um, on the ground in Malawi in 2019, it was very early in the morning in Mulanji. And you were there helping um, some of the mobile clinics get prepared to go out into rural communities. Mm -hmm. um, and, and these mobile clinic clinics are staffed with clinical officers, nursing assistants, mm -hmm. a driver. Everybody is working to provide what we call primary care services mm -hmm. um, to the community. So it's, it's really amazing to witness. Um, and it speaks to how important nurses are in the delivery of, um, of just primary care services. In fact, globally, nurses deliver 80% of the care um, that people need most. Um, and actually, with Gaia, almost 30% of our staff are nurses. Isn't that right, Lucy? Yes, yes, yes. More than yeah. 30%, more than 30 of our staff are nurses. Right. Actually, the, the executive director is also a nurse. So it's a nurse-led organization. Do that you? is right. Yes, our, our country director, Joyce Jerry, is also a nurse, also yeah. um, passionate about women's health and children's health and HIV. Um, I wanted to get your perspective because you've been on the ground um, during the COVID pandemic. We're almost going into almost two years now. Um, and, you know, if you look up the WHO, you'll see some stats that there's estimated over 400,000 cases. There's been 2,300, I think, two deaths that have been reported in Malawi. Um, and you know, and the, those are the numbers we hear about, but I wanna hear from you, what's it, what's it like right now on the ground in Malawi? Yes, as you know, that's the global pandemic COVID has affected most of the uh, livelihood activities. So the same uh, COVID has had the very strong impact in Malawi, in Malawi as well. Uh, we're looking at the effect that COVID has had on this health system, economics, economically and even socially, uh, it was not that easy. Uh, I think when we, when we had a few, the first few cases, the masses were not ready to accept that we have cases, we have the, pan the pandemic amid this death. So it took time for people to realize the importance of uh, social distancing, the importance of uh, masking up. But with time, people now have adjusted to the changes we've seen the, um, the, the health system, we had also challenges where we did not have adequate resources to prepare our, we didn't have facilities specifically to deal, to, to, to manage the cases. So the government had to come in to make sure that we have a few cases and then the, the healthcare, uh, healthcare workers are also supported with the necessary uh, protective equipment to make sure that when they're providing care, we are able to protect ourselves as healthcare providers. But um, as, a, as of now, at least we have reduced numbers of cases. So we just had our third wave. Uh, the numbers are going down, but we still have fears of people, especially fears on getting vaccinated. Currently in Malawi, only 3% are fully vaccinated. So you can imagine, uh, we currently have all the vaccines, three types of vaccines available, but only 3% of people are vaccinated. The good thing is that now the Minister of Health has come in to uh, also do mobile vaccines, uh, conduct mobile vaccine sites where people should go and have uh, get the vaccination. And we've also used the artists to also disseminate information on uh, COVID vaccine so that at least people should be aware and also take up the vaccine so that we protect the masses. But so far, so good. Yes, we've had more than 2,000 days. Uh, but we've managed to control. I know for sure there was a time when schools were closed and there were some issues to do with girls now getting pregnant, teenage pregnancies. 
I don't really have that at the moment, but there were several cases that were reported. Even us in Mulanje, uh, well, and in Palombe, we had a few cases of girls that got pregnant during the long period of waiting for schools to reopen. So socially, economically, we've had those challenges, but now people are adapting, people are changing, and we hope the uptake of COVID vaccine will also go up so that uh, everyone else should protect, should be protected, sure. Um, that's that's very good. I really like the uh, the part where we, you're talking about um, advocating for people to make sure that everyone else is protected and that everyone else has access uh, to the vaccine and other resources. I think where I want to kind of step back a little bit is you as a nest leader that's been working in rural communities to make sure they have equitable access to care. And I have a couple of questions on this. Um, what do you think are the barriers? I mean, going back to your work uh, with HIV, and now, of course, now that we're working in the pandemic, what mm -hmm. do you think have been the barriers um, on the forefront for people accessing these services? Yes, um, I think mainly uh, community awareness was not uh, done much. So people had fears, uh, even if, uh, they knew that maybe if they go to a facility and access services, they will be able to be protected because they have to put on masks. So community awareness delayed, uh, delayed, and so people had fears. But uh, as you know, Gaia has been implementing um, community activities. So we normally don't work on our own. We collaborate with the stakeholders, the district council, the Minister of Health, and other other departments. So. We also went into partnership with the Minister of Health, uh, the District Health Office, to go and conduct community sensitization. So we supported the Minister of Health to do community sensitization so that people should be aware. Uh, you see, like for us, and even in health facilities, government health facilities, now people were more comfortable to come to put on masks, to come and access uh, health, uh, health services because they had linked, they were now aware that they can go out, put on a mask and get protected. So we partnered with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the Minister of Health, the Department of Health to conduct several community awareness campaigns. And also uh, there was a time when we also partnered and supported the Minister of Health to go out and disseminate information on COVID vaccine. But I, the biggest, biggest, biggest issue that we had was the awareness, the awareness. But for us also considering that we, we, we offer community services, amidst the pandemic, we couldn't just cut the services. Even our staff had fears at first. They had fears, we don't have full PPEs, what are we going to do? So we had to lobby uh, for more funding, make sure that our, our clinic staff are fully protected we, we 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 had all the protective gear so that when they go into the community to offer the services they should feel uh, protected and lucky enough now that when we have the vaccine at least more than 90 percent we almost 98 percent of our staff are vaccinated so we also encourage even people that we work with to get vaccinated so so far we've seen uh, that um, a positive outcome uh, out of the community awareness, uh, awareness activities that we've conducted. And maybe just a kind of follow up to, the, uh, to that question is, so based on the work, so we in Gaia, you do mobile health clinics, you do outreach clinics to reach people that are in the hardest to reach areas. Uh, how do you think that the work that you've been doing in Gaia prepared you for the COVID-19 pandemic? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, great, great, great. Because um, our, our, the Gaia staff normally uh, conduct community activities and uh, over time we built trust, uh, the community trust our work. So we were able to also work hand in hand with community leaders uh, during the, service provision our team before even the pandemic conduct health education um, activities so we went through the community uh, communities through partnered with the community leaders and then we continued to do the community sensitization so that's one part where we already conduct community sensitization on different health health services including the hiv hiv um, hiv epidemic so Besides that, we also make sure that we have available resources 
to support our services, deliver of services. So even with the pandemic coming in, we know for sure that without resources, we wouldn't be able to offer the services. So we had to make sure that we have the resources really available to make sure that our people are protected and we continue providing services. So we've seen a very good positive outcome out of that. Thank you, that's, that's really good. Sure. And you know, as you were talking, Lucy, um, I, I remember being on, here in the United States hearing about, you know, the need for PPE on the ground and, you know, how you all were, were going about being so resourceful and getting local tailors to help with, with gowns and, and sourcing, um, sourcing all the PPE you needed. And, and I know a lot of the Gaia community and donors helped to provide that support. Um, but I just wanted to, to hear from you. How did you, during that time, you know, a lot of healthcare workers were very fearful. How did you um, help support each other, the Gaia staff during that time? Yes, we continually to reassure ourselves. And because we also work with um, the main Minister of Health staff, the district health office, we also supported the district health office team. Because there are times when we have them on our on our team to go out and provide services. So we also supported the district health offices with um, uh, PPEs to make sure that their people are also protected because the need for PPEs was all over, all over. And then uh, specifically at district level, we have um, uh, response teams. And this is a team which has all pertinence, including the district, um, the district council people. So we had to come in as a team, uh, create um, an environment where we need to train our staff. So we had to ask the district health office to also train our providers. So basically, our team received training on COVID-19 on how to prevent, how to identify, how to diagnose, how to refer. So that training equipped our, our staff to, to go out into the communities and continue to work and conduct the injuries besides the PPEs that we supported them. So they had knowledge on how best they can prevent themselves, knowledge to disseminate to the community, knowledge on how to quarantine and screen people. We've had cases screened at, the first, at our mobile clinics and then referred and then confirmed to have COVID. So that prepared, preparedness helped us a lot. That when we, we started uh, continuing to give the services amidst the pandemic, our team was well prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's really yeah. I I really like um, the preparations that have been there. I, I was following the pandemic uh, throughout. I think it taught me a lot on what a global community we are. Yes. and how we can learn from each other and also at the same time there's so many things that are specific to specific communities yeah i agree i think as a nurse um sometimes there's been moments in the pandemic where you feel just so overwhelmed um with everything that's changing and how to help educate your your clients your patients and their families mm -hmm. um and and people are looking to someone who's trusted. Um, and so I, I know that they, a lot of people have been looking to Gaia um, on the ground and um, thank you for, for your work in, in some hard places, but, but also it's, it sounds like it was so appreciated too. Yeah. And I think one thing that um, Melanie and Lucy, you raised that I think we need to uh, to continue beyond the pandemic is how to support each other as nurses on the front line. And it, this goes to any other healthcare um, group, um, in any other profession that we have. Uh, the pandemic has been draining. I mean, in the past year and this year, we've been having a, the year of the nurse and celebrating all of the great work that nurses do. But one thing we were, not, we were remembering is how much the pandemic can cause fatigue stress and trauma from patient losses and also fear because i mean we are humans too um we are not plastic that we don't feel 
that we don't stress. So all of those things, we, we have to consider that as we support our clients, we create um, an environment where we support each other. And we need that. If we have to retrain all of the new nurses coming in, if we have to retrain even the older nurses that are already in this system, we have to start by emotionally and socially supporting them during times like this. Um, what are your thoughts, Lucy, about that? You are right, Gabon. You are right. I think that's one area that we also emphasize to be on the lookout for each other. You know, it's so draining. It, it, the pandemic has drained the energy in the healthcare workers. And you know, most of the forefront workers are nurses, and uh, that has really affected them so much. So, even as to encourage, to you know, it's so draining. To be on the lookout for each other. So uh, we encourage people to support each other, nurses to support each other. Also do um, a peer screening. If you see maybe your colleague is not feeling well, please come in, please assist them, please tell them, okay, can you please go and have yourself checked? So that has really helped to um, build strong collaborations, strong relationships among nurses and also strong support system among nurses. Sure. Yeah. I remember when I was starting nursing as a novice nurse. I mean, the pandemic wasn't there then, but when I started dealing with losing patients, I think debriefing was very helpful just to kind of talk to my uh, instructors and talk about how I am feeling. Yeah, I think we need to bring that back, especially the young students that are going through this pandemic and being rushed through their programs. We need to, we need to support them if we have to keep them. So I think the other question that I had is now looking back towards the pandemic, what are the key takeaway lessons? And, and, and I mean, this is not just to you, Lucy, I would like to hear from Melanie as well. So what are the key takeaway lessons that we've had from the pandemic? Hmm, great. Um, I think from the lessons of the pandemic, I would say we need a very strong political will you know, when the pandemic just started, not only in Malawi, most countries, those, um, I think we had challenges whereby politicians, you know, politicized, politicized the whole pandemic mm -hmm. thing. So we need a very strong political will that uh, understands the need to support the healthcare system and also uh, get prepared for any disasters because uh, I think disaster preparedness for me is very crucial. We need to have very strong systems in terms of disaster preparedness. And also just making sure that we support um, the healthcare workers uh, on time. So I think some of the lessons that I've learned during this pandemic would be those ones, sure. Yeah. Okay. What about you, Melanie? What have been your key takeaways. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly agree with everything Lucy said. And um, man, I, I probably need some time to process. I'm still probably processing it and still learning. But I think um, from a personal and, and professional point of view, I think what I've learned is that the pandemic has really brought to light a lot of the weaknesses in all of our healthcare systems. Um, and I think that, you know, the equal access and right to healthcare varies from country to country. And I think that, that um, getting access is a key part of fighting this pandemic. Um, and so I think that's been, been really just brought to the forefront. Um, and I think that as a nurse on a day-to-day -day level, um, you know, it's, it's also been a privilege to walk with people through a difficult time and have them share their vulnerabilities and their questions and their hesitancies. Um, because I think that is a very special place to be, to have someone's trust and to be able to answer questions like that. And then I think the last lesson I've learned um, is really that, that this is a marathon, nursing as a career through a pandemic, and we will get through this, you know, but it really is a marathon and that we have to take care of ourselves um, through it. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think those are kind of my three lessons I've learned. 
<laughs> yeah, and I do agree with both of you. I mean, looking back to the pandemic, as I said, uh, it's taught us that we are a global world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that ability, when I was looking at access to vaccination, it's been um, it's been very challenging when you see some countries have more access than others. And I know there's another layer of acceptability of the vaccine that we have to look into, but equal access starts with the global community working together to make sure that everyone is safe. Because I mean, one, one country can, can be safe, but another is not safe, we can still infect each other. I think the pandemic has taught us that. And, and when it comes to the lower level of acceptability of vaccines, and as Lucy said, Malawi has only 3% that is fully vaccinated. I mean, in the US, we are also struggling uh, with vaccinations as well in some populations. And I feel like as healthcare workers, this is a key takeaway of building trust with our communities. Um, it's difficult to build trust during a crisis. I'm not saying that we can't, but we can still do the best that we can. But it's important that post the pandemic, when there is no stress at all, that we get back to the drawing board and see how we can change the nar narrative of the relationship between the providers and the communities. Uh, what do they expect from us and, and, and to build that relationship that we can trust and share information with each other to be overloaded during a crisis will cause fear, will cause stress and confusion and might affect those, uh, those issues. And, and another key takeaway that also has come to me is the mental health implications of all of these things that people go through. Mental health has been neglected globally. And I'm a very big advocate of mental health. And I'm seeing that as we, we nurses talk about holistic care, we talk about making sure a person is not just physically healthy, but psychologically healthy as well. So this pandemic has taught us that to, to hear our clients and support them, link them with resources. I guess that's what Malawi needs to start working on is um, making resources available for mental health for, for clients. So yeah, and I don't know if Melanie, if you have any questions for Lucy or if Lucy has any additional comments. Um, I, I don't have any more questions. I didn't know if we got anything. I can't see the Facebook feed, so I don't know if we have any questions from the Facebook community. Um, but we're just grateful, Lucy, to have this time with you. What we forgot to mention is that you're actually in the United States here <laughs> to receive a very important award, which you received last week. Is that correct? Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes, Melanie, it's, 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 I'm honored that um, an association of nurses in AIDS care recognized my work and, um, and uh, awarded me with um, uh, a, a global HIV and nurse excellence, uh, global excellence in HIV nursing care. Um, this award is given to nurses who have done exceptionally uh, in terms of HIV nursing care in resource limited countries, just like Malawi. So I was here indeed to receive uh, that award. Uh, mainly, award, um, I was nominated by one of the uh, GAIA team members in the US, Ellen. So basically, um, um, this award, uh, the team that reviews the nominees looks at the leadership part of the um, a nominee, looking at how he, as, as, as a nurse leader in HIV nursing care, you've managed um, to lead a team successfully implement HIV uh, nursing uh, services, and also looks at the innovate in innovations, and also in the actual uh, uh, practice, uh, HIV nursing care. Uh, so when Ellen nominated me, uh, the team reviewed, and then they felt you know, it was the right person, I was the right person for the award. So. I was really honored because I understand in as much as this award is given to me, but it's also an award given to Global AIDS Interfaith Alliance because I've, I've done most of my HIV nursing work uh, with Global AIDS Interfaith Alliance. Uh, though uh, the advocacy part started when I was uh, uh, working with the Minister of Health advocating for youth-friendly health services, 
making sure that we 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 promote disclosure. So all that week, uh, when the team reviewed, they honored me and awarded me the Excellence in Global HIV Nursing Care, which I got on the 13th of November in Washington, DC. Yeah, that's that's amazing. So I'm going to follow up on that. So moving forward, what are your plans? Because <laughs> this is, I, I, I must say, I love your humility <laughs> and because you have done amazing work and you deserve this award um, and because you've done so much uh, for our community and for Gaia and for our patients, mm -hmm. uh, including your team that you work with that you lead. So you've done a lot of great work. So moving forward, mm -hmm. uh, what are your plans or what the thoughts of what you're going to do? Yes. Um, so far, what I've noted, I think for us uh, back in Malawi, uh, there's several uh, areas that we, we still are uh, struggling in terms of making sure that we, at the moment, because my interest now is HIV in children, uh, there's several areas that I've noted that we're not doing well, and um, I would like to pardon out some of my colleagues, uh, look into the uh, research areas, and then see how best we, we can come up with intervention specifically targeting uh, the gaps that we have. Um, specifically to talk about an act, I think in Africa, it's not well known. We have a few members. I think most of the members are in Nigeria. Of course, we have some in Botswana, but I just want to bring that awareness, um, I think to my fellow nurses globally, that for us, for the need uh, to uh, look into issues of nurse, HIV nursing care. And if you look at Malawi, uh, workforce. Most of the uh, uh, HIV care is also done by the nurses. So I want to bring that awareness to the nurses that we can do more and we can share our work globally. So mainly I'll also be sharing, I think in the next, um, uh, I think uh, in the next um, ANAC uh, meetings, I'll also be sharing some of the work that we've done. We also plan to have uh, webinars and um, I'm part of the global committee at ANAC, so I want also to bring in additional nurses from Africa, from Malawi, to participate and be part of the global committee, because this is where we also share the global impact in terms of HIV implementation. So, yeah, so that's where my focus is on the moment. And that's great leadership there, and that's why I say you inspire me a lot, because you're looking into um, sharing all of these experiences with other people. Um, and you know, there's a lot of things, even before I did my grad school, I didn't know a lot of things because I was not sensitized, even um, of research, evidence-based practice, all of those things that we didn't really think we could tap into them because we didn't have exposure to them. I know that our associations in Malawi are now doing actively um, sensitization on evidence-based practice. So you also sensitizing people about ANAC and the role that it has and, and so many other ways that we as nurses can work with the global uh, community. And you know, we are part of that global community. So I'm, I really like that, that when you go back home, you're going to engage and collaborate with people and hope you can also collaborate with us that are here because I mean, it's always nice. I love collaborating back home. I have, I'm passionate about the work back home, so. Great, yes, you're right, go on. Okay. Um, and hopefully yeah. this won't be our last nurses, Gaia Nurses Corner Kaboni, so. Exactly, I'm really, uh, I'm really uh, hoping that we can do more of this and we can follow up with you, Lucy, after a while to see what you've done in the next year. I'm, I'm always excited during our meetings for Gaia, learning about um, the change, the statistics have greatly improved, even with ART therapy, you, your teams have done excellent work in making sure that people are, 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 are taking their medications and that you're, yeah, it's great, it's amazing work. And I'm sure that people that support this work feel the same. Mm -hmm. So, and the board feels the same. They are very excited with what um, the team in Malawi does. And I think uh, moving forward, I'm also hoping to, I am a researcher myself besides being, um, Link to Gaia, I'm a researcher myself, so hopefully to collaborate. I do babies and women, but the, the babies become children, right? 
Yes. So, <laughs> so yeah, so we are linked in uh, in so many ways that we can, and and Melanie is, is your team. She is the pediatric crew. Mm -hmm. We are all interconnected in a certain way as, you know, we have mother to child transmission as well of HIV. Oh, it would be a pleasure indeed to collaborate on so many areas. So I think, like Melanie said, uh, this being the first, I'm sure it's not the last one. Uh, we need to have more of these, uh, these, uh, these uh, thing conferences and make sure that maybe we also involve um, part of the nursing team in Malawi to join and globally other, other people, not only from the US, to join and share the experiences as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we actually have a question from our viewers. So uh, the question uh, is, uh, is for Lucy. So they want to know how Gaia identifies children with HIV. So. All right, thank you. As I mentioned earlier that we work in collaboration with the Minister of Health. So the, our entry point at the district health facilities. This is where we, we, we get data of uh, children that are living with HIV. And through them, we also identify siblings because our work is mainly in the community, but we link with our colleagues at the facility level. So we have community case workers who go in the communities at a household uh, to do a household assessment. And then if we identify siblings of children living with HIV or biological children uh, of caregivers that are living with HIV, we also take an opportunity and conduct index testing. And then if we have those that test HIV positive, we leave them back to a facility for them to receive necessary care. So it's not only just looking at HIV testing, but also continuously to make sure that children living with HIV are going through their routine uh, viral load testing. And for those that have high viral load, we make sure that we follow their uh, intensive adherence counseling and make sure that we have a positive outcome within a short period of time. Uh, we have our motto um, that we say one day for a child living with HIV is too many and reduce viral load in children to save lives. So that's our motto that keeps us going to make sure that we reduce the viral load and also we reduce new deaths in, in children living with HIV. Thank you so much. So, I mean, we, it's almost time for us to, um, to wrap this up, but I just wanted to, to thank um, you for the work that you do and uh, for the, making the time. I know with the time change and jet lags, it's not easy for you to do all of this, but you've made this opportunity to share with us your work. And I also thank you, Melanie, for uh, helping organize this um, and I hope there'll be many more opportunities of this that uh, we will invite more people on the ground so we can hear what they're doing and how um, how they are um, achieving all of the goals that they're doing. Mm. Uh, as a nurse I'm so proud of all of us and all of the nurses for all of the work they have done during the pandemic. We've done great. That's what I would say. We should pat ourselves on the back. We've done a very good job. And, um, and I know that we should feel appreciated no matter how hard it is. And that I hope that in the following years, we'll continue to work as a team and encouraging and supporting each other. So, and thanks for our viewers uh, and all of us, all those that will view later. And we hope that we, you will join us for more um, discussions and chats that we will have with our nurses in Malawi. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.